Good afternoon, I'm Anthony Log with the Midday News. A special welcome if you're watching on OneSpotMedia.com. Three suspects, including a woman, have been taken into custody in connection with yesterday's double murder in Manchineal, Portland. A senior investigator told TVJ News that the three are to be questioned about the murder of 59-year-old Annette Carby Lindsay and 59-year-old Linval Lindsay. Mrs. Lindsay was found with chop wounds to the face at her house while her husband, Linval Lindsay, was seen on the roadway with wounds. It's reported that sometime after midnight, the police received information that explosions were heard. The bodies of the two were discovered. The impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on the tourism sector was further put into perspective during the ministry's presentation to Parliament's Public Administration and Appropriations Committee, PAAC, on Wednesday. The ministry has also given a glimpse of why there's optimism for the coming months. Herman Green reports. In her report to the PAAC on Wednesday, Permanent Secretary in the Tourism Ministry, Jennifer Griffiths, gave a breakdown of the industry figures over the past year. For the January to December 2020 period, Jamaica welcomed over 1.3 million visitors, which was a 68% reduction when compared to the previous year. Jamaica also recorded foreign exchange earnings of 1.3 billion US dollars, which was a 64% decline in comparison to 2019. Additionally, there was a $37 billion reduction in government revenue between March and December 2020 due to reductions in airport charges and taxes, cruise taxes, and guest accommodation room taxes. However, Director of Tourism with the Jamaica Tourist Board, Donovan White, says there has been small but steady growth in visitor arrivals since reopening to visitors and a positive outlook for summer 2021. Out of the United States, for example, um, our partners JetBlue, have opened two new gateways out of the U.S. for the summer, um, out of Raleigh, North Carolina, and out of uh, Newark in New Jersey. Never flew from those gateways before. The only two new gateways they have opened out of the U.S. for the summer is to Jamaica. But Member of Parliament for St. Catherine Southern, Fitz Jackson, had questions about sector preparations. What are some of those things that are being done in this downtime? We now are um, advertising on all the major networks in the United States through the end of June. Uh, uh, we are also, we have, we have now appointed through approvals from Cabinet our new PR agencies for the US, Canada and the UK. We have added new agents. We have added agents to the land selling of Jamaica that were only selling crews before, so we are now diversifying our travel agent marketplace. Additionally, Mr. White says online promotions, including a virtual wedding on a beach in Jamaica, have created greater interest in destination Jamaica. Herman Green, TVJ News. A wedding is one of the most magical days for so many, but leading up to the event can be very stressful, especially during the COVID-19 pandemic. O'Shane Masters explains why. Jamaica is ranked among the top destinations for weddings in the world, and event planners across the island are burning the candles at both ends to ensure the dreams of many brides become a reality. But with the peak summer season fast approaching, some of those dreams are slowly turning into nightmares. It comes as Prime Minister Andrew Holness announced the maximum number of individuals allowed in attendance at a wedding is 15. Even though, Madam Speaker, I don't know what it is, but uh, I'm not getting so many complaints about the number for, for weddings. Uh, maybe there is a certain economy at play. President of the Jamaica Wedding Professionals Association, Ophelia McKnight, says her job is to keep more than 500 brides calm, with some facing the possibility of having their weddings postponed. I'm hoping to have audience. I think, like everybody, we are all very frustrated. Domiola, a Nigerian and a Jamaican fiancé, are both living in Canada and have been planning their wedding for more than a year. But with the current COVID-19 measures in place, a wedding that was planned to accommodate 80 guests would be reduced to 15 persons. 
And with the possibility of more than $3.5 million going down the drain, they have decided to have a civil wedding instead. Then the guests and the newlyweds will come to Jamaica. Wedding designer Francine Foster, who has been plying her trade for over 10 years, says she's pushed to the limit. I am losing sleep because the reality is no, wedding season is upon us. Um, my first wedding is actually for this month and uh, we have had to make some very drastic changes um, just so the bride can have her wedding. Wedding entities are calling for some leeway. Events management specialist at Rose Hall Development, Gerdine Myers, says proper procedures are in place at the property to facilitate huge gatherings. Our venues are very ideal for the climate we're in. We have acres and acres of outdoor beautiful spaces with whatever is needed to social distance, contact tracing so that we can deliver on the product that our international clients are, are needing and our locals. We have local weddings as well. The planners are also calling for clarity from the government. So at this point, we are just hoping that somebody somewhere will have a conversation with us, listen to what is going on, have us educate them on exactly how people are being impacted and to do something about creating a more formal presence for us um, with appropriate you know, regulations so that we can begin to operate in a way that allows us to take care of our clients. In the meantime, small business operators who are direct beneficiaries from weddings are also feeling the squeeze. The coconut man, the lady who makes the tambourine balls and the drops, the pink on top, those are the things that our wedding guests wants to give to their guests as favors because it's the authentic Jamaican experience. O'Shane Masters, TVJ News. 14 additional deaths have been recorded from the COVID-19 virus. Eight of the deaths were recorded in Trelawney, three from St. Thomas, two from St. Anne, and one from St. Mary. Five of those deaths were previously under investigation. The COVID-19 death toll is now 834, and 98 new cases of the virus were confirmed yesterday from 766 samples. The country's overall case count is now 47,020. The country's COVID-19 positivity rate now stands at 12.3%. In the meantime, 164 persons are hospitalized with a respiratory illness, 14 are critically ill. There are now 23,085 active cases. And it's time for a break, but stay with us. More stories when we return. Welcome back. Continuing the news. Justice Minister Delroy Chuck is moving ahead with legislation to allow the Office of the Director of Public Prosecutions the right to appeal in exceptional circumstances. The minister opened debate in Parliament yesterday on two bills which will allow prosecutors to appeal certain decisions. The bill seek to one, amend the law to grant to the prosecution a right of appeal where there has been a verdict of acquittal in an administration, administration of a justice offense. Secondly, Madam Speaker, where there has been a verdict of acquittal based on a point of law or a point of mixed law and fact that was erroneously upheld by the trial judge. Thirdly, Madam Speaker, the sentence handed down was unduly lenient and manifestly inadequate for the offence. Mr. Chuck says there will also be changes to the Criminal Justice Administration Act to provide an exception to the rule of double jeopardy. The rule against double jeopardy shields persons from being prosecuted twice for the same crime. We have never had this right of appeal. Because it is felt that once you have a trial and the man is acquitted, that should be it. That has been the common law position for centuries. The truth of the matter, Madam Speaker, is that in the past few decades, it has been recognized well that there are many cases where witnesses have been interfered with, witnesses have been prevented from giving evidence, and where DNA evidence was not available at the time of trial to demonstrate the guilt of the person 
and therefore the accused is able to get a not guilty verdict and justice in those circumstances are not served. Countries like Barbados, Trinidad and Bermuda have passed legislation to allow the prosecution a limited right of appeal. The regional effort is ongoing to assist citizens of St. Vincent and the Grenadines following the losses and displacement caused by the eruption of La Safrier Volcano. And as you'll hear in this report, students in Jamaica have also been playing their part. The authorities have changed the volcanic alert levels in St. Vincent and the Grenadines from red to orange. This means the danger from the eruptions from La Safrier has been reduced. However, the needs of a people are still the same. And here in Jamaica, large and small groups, including these Central High School students, are doing their part to get humanitarian aid to their Caribbean neighbors. We are on this water drive to donate to our neighbors from St. Vincent and the Grenadines. We basically connected with all stakeholders of this institution, our parents, students, teachers, and also our past students who have helped to donate water. And we are connecting now with the United Nations Association of Jamaica to make our donations to St. Vincent. In addition to helping those in need, the initiative helped get some bored students who are home involved in life-changing activity. Our young people need to understand the importance of helping others and this initiative has definitely been our first in this format where we could impact globally. I think you know we are giving back, are giving to um, persons who are well in need and um, therefore you know I think and or I feel you know it is something good. So I totally support it. The need is great in St. Vincent and the Grenadines. Prime Minister Ralph Gonzalez said it will require hundreds of millions of U.S. dollars for the country to recover from the volcanic eruption. The Central High Group is therefore encouraging all members of the school body and school community in Clarendon to continue donating to groups helping the Caribbean nation. The morning and whatever you can donate, we will accept. It is a worthy cause. Today for them, tomorrow for us, we will never know where Jamaica will be, so we continue to give to reap the blessings in the future. O'Shane Masters, TVJ News. Five people escaped serious injury following a motor vehicle crash along the Baptist Main Road in St. Thomas Tuesday afternoon. About four o'clock, a Toyota Sienna was heading towards Poorman's Corner when the driver lost control of the vehicle. A Toyota Isis, which was traveling in the opposite direction, swung to avoid a collision, however, it later overturned. It's understood that three persons were aboard the Toyota Isis while two passengers were in the Toyota Sienna. They received minor injuries and were taken to hospital for medical assessment. The crash caused a traffic pileup, however, it was not long before the police arrived on the scene to ease the traffic congestion. An urgent appeal for help this afternoon for a young woman who's on the verge of losing her sight. She's hopeful that surgery will help to get her life back on track, but first, she has to find $1.3 million needed to pay for the surgery. Sandy Williams has her story. Last December, 21-year-old Kishana Watkiss received some devastating news. She discovered she had corneal high drops in her right eye. It is a complication of advanced thinning and bulging of the cornea, the transparent part of the eye, which gradually becomes cloudy, leading to a sudden and painful decrease of visual sharpness. The doctor said that it can affect both eyes if it's not treated ASAP. And uh, it can reach to a point where the right eye can refuse the cornea if it's not been if the surgery is not done as soon as possible after receiving the diagnosis kishana was advised that she will need to undergo a cornea transplant they said that it's a mandatory surgery it has to be done because if it has, if it's not been done 
you're going to reach a point where the eye is going to refuse the cornea like it, that it, if i got another cornea it can't it cannot help any at all but the surgery cost eight thousand five hundred us dollars or 1.3 million jamaican dollars funds she does not have Kishana is currently unemployed, and because of her condition, getting a job has proven to be challenging. It's a bit like a setback for me now, because even if I want to work, I cannot work, because I am mostly in the form of a business field, like data entry and so forth, and you know that when you're doing those type of work, it's, made, it's more, mainly focusing on computer and I know that the computer with the eye is a no-no. I am trying other sources to see if I can get help other other way and to see hopefully that the other sources that I'm trying become successful because that is the only way because I'm not employed and my mother is not employed as well. In the meantime, she's making an appeal to corporate Jamaica for assistance. If anyone out there who is willing to assist me right now to reach this goal, I'll be very, very appreciative. It'll be a very, it will be very grateful to me right now. Sandy Williams, TVJ News. And for the latest in the financial world, we go to Javon Keys with a business minute. Listed company First Rock Capital Holdings is expanding its footprint in Costa Rica through its subsidiary First Rock Capital Latam. The company has partnered with building and construction firm Grupo Inmobiliario del Parque to build 160 one-bedroom units in the Central American state. This is First Rock's third project in Costa Rica in almost two years. And for the year which ended December 31, 2020, First Rock posted a net profit of U.S. $2.6 million. That's up from the U.S. $692,000 recorded for 2019. The company published its audited results on Wednesday. First Rock says COVID-19 has not significantly impacted its business and it expects things to remain that way. Berger Payne saw an 18% improvement in revenues for the January to March quarter compared to the same period in 2020. The company earned $597.5 million, almost $90 million more than the revenues in the corresponding period last year. The Consumer Affairs Commission CAC has secured $22 million in refunds and compensation to consumers for the last fiscal year which ended in March. Commerce Minister Audley Shaw told Parliament on Wednesday that the Commission handled 1,851 complaints with 80% of them being resolved. And later in the business day, construction booming and lumber prices rising. Listed company Lumber Depot weighs in. And that's it for the Business Minute. I'm Javon Keyes. And in news overseas, the streets of Colombia saw the 15th consecutive day of anti-government rallies on Wednesday as protesters across the country demonstrated against officials' handling of the pandemic and police violence. To date, 42 people have been killed and several others injured. More from the CNN. Thousands of protesters took to the streets uh, of uh, Colombia in the 15th consecutive day of uh, demonstrations against uh, the government's handle of the pandemic response uh, and uh, police uh, violence. Uh, 42 people have been killed uh, so far in Colombia in this, uh, in this wave of protest that is sweeping across the nation, according to the Colombian ombudsman. And even though the government has made concession to the demonstrators, such as canceling university fees for lower income students, uh, the marches show no sign of slowing down, as you can see. And on Wednesday, President Ivan Duque pledged to get to the bottom of the allegations over police violence and alleged excessive use of force. President Duque was speaking exclusively to CNN's Christiana Mampur and take a listen to what he said. We have now 65 accusations on members of the military or the police, but specifically 98% on possibilities uh, regarding police activities. 65 cases have been opened because we have a zero tolerance policy for any individual conduct that is beyond the law. 
and eight of those 65 cases are for alleged homicide at the hands of the Colombian police. And for a midday roundup of sporting activities from the Issa Grace Kennedy Boys and Girls Championships at the National Stadium, here's Karen Madden. 18 finals are slated for today's day three of the Issa Grace Kennedy Boys and Girls Athletics Championships. The day began with the continuation of the Boys Open Decathlon's 110 meter hurdles, which overall event leader Deshaun Lamb of Calabar claimed in a record 13.93 seconds. The girls' 400 meter hurdles open then took center stage with Gariel White of Heidel recording the fastest time, 59 seconds flat ahead of tomorrow's final. The boys' equivalent sees Shamir Little recording 53.74 seconds, a personal best, topping all qualifiers. Reporting from the National Stadium, Karen Madden. And that's the Midday News. I'm Anthony Lugg. Join us at 7 for Primetime News. On behalf of the news, sports and production teams, good afternoon.